grave. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. God, we come rejoicing. Would you stand with me as I uh, pray the Lord's presence in this place? God, we thank you that you have gathered us here today on this beautiful rainy day, God. Thank you, God, that you will uh, be with us this morning, God. We know that wherever we go, we can't escape your presence, God. So we know that here this morning, you are here. God, help us remember that through every song, through every verse, through every scripture, through, every, uh, through the giving, through the sermon, through the invitation, God. Let us remember that you are present, God. We stop for just a second, God, and we, we invite you into our minds right now as we focus on you. Thank you for your presence. We rejoice. We are here to worship you. Amen. This morning we have an awesome privilege. We're going to see two 12-year-olds being baptized into the faith today. These two 12-year-old young ladies have been friends uh, since they were in the... Uh, the nursery together here at Christ Church. And so they have a long history together, so it's only fitting that they would uh, walk through this time of their lives and, um, and celebrate this baptism. I want to encourage each one of us as baptized Christians that we too would be reminded today the life that we live, we live in the power of the Holy Spirit because of the revelation of Jesus Christ, that He came to us and reconciled us in relationship to our Father. And what a good God we serve. So, well, Stephanie Mabry, come on down. Well, Stephanie, have you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for your life on this earth and for your eternal life? And have you repented of your sins and intend to live for Jesus the rest of your life? Well, Stephanie Mabry, upon your profession of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, and your confidence in Him concerning His death, burial, and resurrection. I now bury you in the waters of baptism in the beautiful and powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jasmine McCoy, have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and trusted Him for your life on this earth and for your eternal life? And have you repented of your sins and do you intend to live for Jesus all the days of your life? Well, Jasmine, upon your profession of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and your confidence in Him concerning His death, His burial, and resurrection, now bury you in the waters of baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Continue in worship. Amen. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. Let our praise be your welcome. And let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. Let your breath, let your breath come from heaven, fill our hearts with your life, we are here for you. We are here for you. To you our hearts are open. To you our hearts are open.
Luke 5, 27 through 32 says, after this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not called, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks for
the lyrics. Your grace has found me just as I am. And some of us can remember when that grace found us. And he found us just where we were. We didn't have to be perfect. We were still sinners. We were still a mess. In our human logic, we try to get our ducks in a row before we feel like we're worthy of such an incredible gift. But our grace, our Lord, He found us just where we are. And I don't know where some of you are today, what some of you may be struggling with today, but I hope that those words just ring true in your ears as this service progresses and as Pastor Dan brings his message. He found you just where you are. Don't miss out on what this service has, what the Lord has for us in, in, in song and in, in our worship and in the, the word that's going to be brought towards us today. Don't miss out because you feel like you don't have it together. He found us just where we are. Amen. Amen. I'm looking... I have been looking forward to this Sunday since we started talking about it this week in, in worship team meetings. And I just sensed it even from the very beginning as the band and was rehearsing. There was such an, an enthusiasm and an energy. I hope that you guys are expectant for what the Lord has for us today. And at this time, we're going to invite the children to go to their classes. I trust that the Lord has something for them there as well. The teachers have pre prepared. If this is your first time at Christ Church and you're not sure exactly where to go, we have an information desk here on this level, and we have a Kid Park Center at the, at the atrium level, and they can direct you to where your children need to go. But we pray that the children will be blessed as well. We're going to see what we have coming up this week at Christ Church as we turn our attention to the video announcements. Good morning, my name is Jennifer and here are just some of the events happening right here at Christ Church. Once a quarter, we look forward to the Saturday when we will all come together to fellowship, clean, and this time, paint. Yes, the all church work day is coming up and we have a special opportunity to paint the children's classrooms. We need a lot of hands to get these special classrooms looking good for our children. And if you aren't good at painting, don't worry, there will be plenty of other kinds of housekeeping and activities as well. If you would like more information on how you can help, contact Don Peary at donp at ccnash.org. Twice a year, our choir opens up its doors for new members, and now that we're entering a new year, that is the time upon us once again. Of course, we all know our choir leads us in worship every Sunday morning, but even beyond that, the choir is a vibrant community of believers who meet each Wednesday night for a time of rehearsal, worship, and fellowship together. Also, several times a year, our choir has opportunities to go outside these four walls and carry the gospel even further, singing at special events and recording with a wide variety of artists. If you'd like to join the choir, please pick up an application for choir membership at the information desk in the foyer. Also, in a couple of weeks, on Wednesday night, January the 30th at 5.30 p.m., there will be an orientation meeting followed by an open choir rehearsal where you can get a feel for the heart and the ministry of the choir. For more information, you can contact Beth Colwick at beth at christchurchnashville.org or come speak with Christopher after the services. We are always looking for volunteers to get involved here at Christ Church, and right now we especially need help in the media department. If you're interested in any aspect of audio or video production or camera operation, then please contact John McClure at john at ccnash.org. And lastly, please note that Faith Foundations is taking a one-week break this Wednesday to accommodate anyone taking DMS. Faith Foundations will resume its regular schedule next week on January the 23rd at 6.30 p.m. in room 130. And those are just some of the many great things happening at Christ Church. For more information on these events, check out the online calendar at ccnash.org or pick up a bulletin at any information desk. Jennifer mentioned that we would be taking a one-week break from Faith Foundations for DMS, and that is a disciple ministry school that will be taking place starting January 16th, and it will be running through January 22nd. And the pastor of Nashville Life Church, Alvin Love, he has opened that up to the Congregation of Christ Church. There is a fee that's involved with this, but he says if that's gonna, if that would be a concern for anyone, don't worry about that. If you have any uh, questions or want to find out more information about this ministry school, you could see Hunter Mobley, if he'd wave his hand up there in the choir. 
He's the tallest one in that section if you, <laughs> if you want to point him out when he's standing up. And if, if you don't get a chance to uh, catch Hunter, you can also just contact the church office and we can get you uh, connected to Nashville Life Church and give you more information about this um, wonderful opportunity. We're going to continue our worship as we go to the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. And um, would you just pray with me, bow your heads and pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this day. Lord, this is a brand new day, a day none of us has ever seen before or lived before or walked through, Lord, a day for you to speak new things into our lives. And Lord, we come to you um, as we worship you in our givings, Lord, our tithes and our offerings. Lord, we, are, we celebrate what you've done for us at the end of the year by, by bringing in in abundance, Lord. We still, we still stand in awe of how you do things. And Lord, we know that you can do that for this church. You can do it for us personally. And Lord, so we give. We give to you, abund we give to you cheerfully. And we give to you, Lord, with open hands, knowing that what you will pour back in. Lord, that you will provide for all of our needs personally and for this church. Lord, give this church wisdom in how they, they use these funds. Lord, may your work continue to be, to be carried forward, Lord, in this church, in this community, and in the nations abroad. And we give you the praise and we give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Would you stand with us as we sing that again? Nothing could ever Hallelujah. Love that song. It's the theme song of the Great Welch Revival, 1906, and uh, still powerful lyrics, melody, and all. Read with me St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, 1 through 9. Just read it together with me. One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of Galilee, 
Great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, We worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, O oh Lord, please leave me. I am too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. The word of the Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated. We are reading, of course, in, uh, through Luke's gospel, and then we'll be reading through the book of Acts. And as you can see in your bulletin, the next week we'll be reading chapters 6 through 9. So we invite you to read with us as we continue on uh, each Sunday, um, basing our messages on, on these passages. I want to talk to you today about the theme of this chapter, chapter 5. Most Christians, at least uh, most Christians in the Western world, uh, view salvation as a kind of a legal process. Sinners are forgiven of their sins because of the sacrifice of Christ, and they're saved when they confess their sins and receive God's grace to mend their lives. And we use this metaphor so often that many of us find it difficult to imagine salvation in any other way. But legal transaction is, the, is not the only metaphor that the Bible uses to explain salvation. Uh, it also uses the metaphor of healing of sick souls, which is the main idea we find in Luke chapter 5. And the chapter begins with this fishing story. A group of fishermen who are men who will soon become the first leaders of the Christian church have caught nothing after fishing all night long. And then the Lord comes to them and he asks them to throw their nets over into the deep. But they're tired and they're ready to turn in. And so with perhaps some frustration, uh, Simon Peter says, but Lord, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. But nonetheless, at your word, we'll, we'll let down the nets once more. And they throw out their nets and they catch so many fish that they nearly break their nets. And then the Lord tells them that this catch is prophetic. It points to a much more important kind of fishing. He's going to teach them, he says, to become fishers of men. And the stories that follow in this chapter are examples of the sort of people the disciples will be catching. A leper, uh, a, a paralytic, and then a tax collector. They're not the kind of fish that a spiritual leader in that, the, those times, or perhaps any times, would uh, most wanted. But they are the people that will be most attracted to Jesus they're the kind of fish, if you will, that live in the deep. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, Jesus tells a story, a parable to explain this. He says that the kingdom of God will be like a great net that pulls in all kinds of fish, good and bad. And this chapter teaches the same lesson through stories in the Lord's life. The chapter ends with a grumbling group of traditionalists claiming that the Lord's disciples aren't very pious Whereas the other uh, disciples of, of other spiritual leaders fast and pray, the Lord's disciples drink wine and eat whatever they want. And Jesus responds with an observation of his own about wine, that even though old wine is better than new, new wine has to be made each season to replenish the supply. Nonetheless, he says, the new wine must be poured into uh, new wineskins because new wine can rip old wineskins apart. And that's an, an allusion to what's about to happen to Israel. As wayward Jews and then Gentiles are brought into the kingdom of God, most synagogues will not be able to accept the new converts. 
These odd fish that are coming in from the deep, bringing into the net all kinds of baggage that will be so much strain and will perhaps break the nets. The Lord's point here is to point out uh, to, the, to Israel's leaders that something new is afoot. Although he means no disrespect to the old structures because those structures are things that the Lord himself created, the kinds of people that the Lord intends of bringing into the fold will probably rip the old flock apart. Traditional Judaism will not be able to stretch enough to accommodate the coming harvest and its nets will break. So this chapter is about the Lord's intention to reach those neglected by traditional religion. And he says this quite plainly in the middle of the chapter when he declares that he has not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. He's after people who are out in the deep and he wants to heal them. If you'll forgive me for making one more allusion to uh, Les Miserables, I'd like to point out how the priest in that story wins Jean Valjean to Christ. When we meet Jean Valjean, he's a thief. He even steals from the good man that is trying to help him. And when the, when the uh, policemen drag him back to confront his victim, Father Muriel claims that the silver that Jean Valjean has in his possession was indeed a gift and that in, he had forgotten to take the most valuable part of the collection and left it behind, which were the candlesticks. Now, I, I just thought of it, the two, the two candlesticks traditionally on the altar at, at, at uh, the communion table stands for the light of the Old and the New Testament uh, from which Christians, of course, get their illumination to walk through life. But this unbelievable gracious act haunts Jean, Val Jean Valjean and calls him to spend the rest of his life in repentance from his sins. And he gradually becomes a, a saint, just like uh, the priest who led him to the Lord. And that is, of course, how spiritual life works. People transformed by grace become agents of transformation for others who are also the prisoners of sin. Jesus becomes real to the world through the lives of his saints, through people who, like him, have compassion on those who suffer from sin. Redemptive life comes from those who have released all right to judge and to condemn others. Redemptive life comes through those who have released all right to judge and condemn others. In the musical and, uh, and in the latest film version of Les Miserables, the priest sings to Jean Valjean the lyrics that embody the kind of spiritual hospitality that transform people's lives. Come in, sir, for you're weary, and the night is cold out there. Though our lives are very humble, what we have, we have to share. There is wine here to revive you. There is bread to make you strong. There are a bed to rest till morning, rest from pain and rest from wrong. The lyrics are simply just uh, recapping the Lord's invitation to people who are ill of soul in Matthew 11. Come unto me, all you who are weary and who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I don't know how many of you will remember this. I, I remembered a song from my childhood that I probably hadn't sung for 40 years. And um, uh, it's it just an old hole in a song from uh, the end of 1800s. And uh, we sang it a lot as a kid. And it it, and it's a song probably we wouldn't sing now, but it just the lyrics just struck me that embody what I want to say today. And it says, Hear the blessed Savior calling the oppressed, all you heavy laden, come to me and rest. Come no longer tarry, I your load will bear. Bring me every burden, bring me every care. Come unto me. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Hear me and be blessed. For I am meek and lowly. Come and trust my might. Come, my yoke is easy. And my burden's light, 
Listen to this verse. Cry, have you by temptation often conquered been, has a sense of weakness, brought distress within. Christ will sanctify you if you'll claim his best. In the Holy Spirit, he will give you rest. Come unto me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Hear me and be blessed, for I am meek and lowly. Come and trust my might. Come, my yoke is easy and my burden's light. More of you knew it than I realized. <laughs> See in the second service how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> But Jesus was a teacher, he was a judge, a leader, he was the Messiah, he was all kinds of things, but the core of who Jesus was and the core of what Jesus did was love. Jesus is the expressed image, the incarnated manifestation of the love of God. St. John's Gospel says Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him all people might be saved. But the question is, saved from what? We can see that a man like Jean Valjean needs to be saved. He's a wretched thief. But do I need to be saved? Am I anything like that poor broken man that staggers into the home of Father Muriel to steal from him? And the answer is yes, we, we are th that person. The Bible teaches that though we're made in the image and the likeness of God and we, 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 uh, we bear his image, we're also ill. Our souls are sick. And the good shepherd comes, says the 23rd Psalm, to restore our soul. Jesus is the good shepherd, and he's the one who comes to restore our soul to health. He's the only one who can fit our souls for heaven, and we need Jesus because our souls are sick, and we need healing for our souls. Jesus, uh, Luke presents Jesus here as a healer of souls by telling uh, stories about three men caught in three different kinds of sickness, and contrast those stories with the attitudes of the scribes and Pharisees. There are people who are unwilling to receive healing for their souls, and they can't even acknowledge that their souls are damaged. But let's, let's look at these people who are sick. The first is a leper. Lepers, as you know, had to wander through the countryside, warning healthy people to stay away by shouting, unclean, unclean. They would shout at anybody that came close so they wouldn't be contaminated. But this leper sought Jesus out, and he fell on his knees in front of Jesus, praying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus responds, I am willing, and he touches him. Now, here's you need to notice. When Jesus touched the leper, he became ceremonially unclean himself. Jesus is willing to be thought of as unclean in order to reach people who are in need of healing. Immediately the leprosy leaves the man's body and Jesus instructs the man to go show himself to the priest. And that's the way, that's the, way the man is legally restored to his community. And Jesus demonstrates to doing this, but he's not intentionally breaking Israel's nets. He's just healing people and putting them into the net. But at any rate, making sure the net survives is not the Lord's main concern. His main concern is to catch fish. And we ought to think about that when we are doing church work. The next story is about a paralytic and unlike the, the leper, the paralytic man, uh, he, he's utterly powerless to help himself. And so his friends have to help him get to Jesus. They open up a hole in the roof, the tiles. They take the tiles off and lower the sick man down in front of Jesus. In other words, the sick man's friends have to do for him what he can't do for himself. They're the ones that have to bring the man into contact with Jesus. And sometimes we have to do that for those we love as well who are not yet able to make that move on their own. And when Jesus tells the sick man that his sins are forgiven, tongues begin to wag. Who is he? Who does he think he is? But Jesus asked the question whether it even matters the metaphor we use to describe our sickness or the way we describe how healing comes from Christ. The issue is bringing grace and healing to those who suffer. And in effect, he says here, we cannot judge people and heal them at the same time. We cannot judge people and heal them at the same time. In the th third story, Jesus deliberately goes looking for a political outcast to add to the group. Now, Jesus already has disciples who are this time uh, radically different from the man Jesus is about to meet. James and John, for example, are zealots, and that word means 
that they were uh, zelotes. They were uh, politically opposed to the government. And now Jesus deliberately seeks out somebody who's an employee of the government. Levi, the man that would eventually write the first gospel. He works to raise funds for the same government that James and John oppose. And it's just too much for conservative Jews. How can Jesus possibly fellowship with people uh, whose uh, political views are so different than the ones most conservative Jewish people hold? And this is where the great criticism begins against Jesus. This is where the whisper campaign begins, the raised eyebrows, the shunning of Jesus and his disciples. And, and, and their opposition is not because Jesus is uh, uh, sharing the views of Levi and his friends, but because Jesus is some, after something much more important than people's political differences, and he doesn't seem to notice or comment on them. And so they say, why do you eat and drink with these people, these, these terrible people? And Jesus replies and says, those who are well don't need a physician. It's those who are sick. And I'm not here to care for the righteous. I'm here to call sinners to repentance. In other words, what Jesus is saying, I'm about healing people. I'm not about making people in the synagogue feel better about themselves. And Jesus is focused on the awakening and the healing of our souls. He knows that sinners are often much more aware of the state of their souls than righteous people are, than religious people are. Religion, which consists of the structures of spiritual life, can be so helpful to us, but it can also be the thing that numbs our soul. Self-righteousness is like a spiritual novocaine, and it, it can help us to keep walking through life as though nothing is wrong, even though our souls may be very ill indeed. Our souls can get sicker and sicker as we go about our day-to-day -day lives, speaking religious words, doing religious things. Jesus is clearly after something here that the religious leaders simply didn't get, but what is it? And I think it's this. It's the great physician, the great healer of souls, sees the underlying illness that, that is working to destroy people's lives. He's like a doctor friend that says, Dan, your color doesn't look good, or that mole looks suspicious. Why don't you have it checked out? Well, why should I listen? My other friends, they think everything is cool with me. I'm all right, okay. Why, why should I listen to this party pooper? I should, I should listen to the doctor because he knows what he's talking about. He's not trying to hurt me. He's trying to save my life. Well, the modern world is like, is, is, is like a great big party. There's something always going on. And who wants to listen to a sourpuss that tells us underneath all of this uh, noise and hoopla, something may be amiss and we better pay attention to it. And who has the patience to hear anybody talk about the soul anyway? In these times, we may not even know that we have a soul. Modern life numbs our soul. It silences our soul. It shrinks our soul until we forget we have one. And we become cogs in a machine. We go to work, we come home, we go to sleep, and the next day we go back to work, year after mindless year. And meanwhile, our radio is blaring and the television's always on and we promptly respond to every text and somehow we gotta find time to update our Facebook and read our favorite tweets. But when, when, tell me, will we ever think about the state of our soul? But the soul won't be silenced forever. Sooner or later, it will make its needs known. There are many ways to become aware of your soul. You can notice it through bliss and the time when you discover something that is a source of delight to your soul. It can be music. It can be a love of a child. It can be a spiritual experience of some kind. It can be anything that suddenly floods your soul with bliss. But unfortunately, in our times, it's not usually bliss that awakens our soul. It is usually some kind of pain. If we discover we're seriously ill, all the things that we have been using to numb ourselves suddenly become inadequate and we realize we're going to die, perhaps sooner than we had thought. We're awake and we can't go back to sleep. We may realize we're addicted to some behavior or substance and there's no way out of that painful self-realization and even the addiction no longer keeps us asleep. But until this awakening comes, we often actively work to numb our soul and there's endless ways of doing that. Internet porn, cutting, television, watching, video gaming, shopping, eating, gossiping. The list is endless. There's something that'll work for you if you go out looking for it. Most of us have something that numbs our soul from time to time because the thing most of us fear the most is a self-awakening that will reveal we are flawed and mortal and powerless about what happens to us much in life. Um, and uh, so we are at work much of the time numbing our own pain. I want to talk to you a moment about that. 
I read a link to USA Today this week about internet pornography. That's an example of what I'm talking about. It claims that 90% of men and over 30% of women are immediately triggered by sexual images that if they see them, they are nearly irresistibly pulled toward viewing them again. Now, that's not the problem of a few slimy people. It's a problem that affects most of the people in this room, at least potentially. And the reason is simple. We're hungry for a touch that may awaken something beyond our day-to-day existence. Pornography is like the smell of something cooking on a fire to a person that's hungry. He, he's not sure what's cooking, maybe rattlesnake meat for all he knows, but it's something that's causing him to salivate and he moves toward the direction of the fire. Let's think with me about this. It's terribly uncomfortable, I'm sure, but it's important to talk about. The market has now discovered the kinds of porn that trigger women, too. So all this time we thought men were just the, you know, bad characters, but now the market's discovered things that trigger women. And for millions of women, it, it, it turns out that it's a form of sadomasochism. This kind of women's porn fills the supermarket shelves, airport bookstores, and those books aren't there because the owners are perverts. It's there because it's selling, and it's selling in massive quantities. This kind of literature is bestseller list three or four deep on the uh, New York bestseller list now. But why? It's selling because people want their soul to wake up. And day-to-day existence isn't wakening up their soul. They need something more. Let me mention cutting. Many people now cut themselves or inflict some kind of pain on themselves, and they're terribly embarrassed by it. It's very shameful. There's many people listening to me right now. You cut yourself or do something that causes pain to yourself intentionally. And, and there's all kinds of reasons, medical reasons. I won't go into that. But people do it because they crave physical sensation. There may be no one in their lives that touch them, or maybe they can't feel the touch of those who do offer touch. But at any rate, the people become so lonely and so withdrawn from life that physical pain is the only thing that will remind them they're alive. It's the only thing that makes them capable of feeling something. Isn't it interesting in the context of this chapter that leprosy is a disease that destroys one's ability to feel physical sensation. As the patient loses the feedback mechanism that would otherwise tell him that his hand is in the fire or his foot has been pierced by a nail, he keeps walking as though nothing's happening. Infection soon sets in and he com- and begins to destroy his extremities and a, and, and a leprous person can decay while he's yet alive because he doesn't know how to protect himself from danger. That's the picture of the modern soul. Having lost spiritual sensitivity to images and violence and profanity and extreme marketing, we reach for those kinds of sensations that will assure us that we still matter, that we're still here, and that we're still human. The proper response to this soul sickness is not disdain. It's non-judgmental compassion. Our sin is an illness of soul and we are suffering We don't need to be reminded of the rules. We need someone to introduce us to the great physician. And I'd like to say this bluntly to to all of us that work in church. If the church has no healing grace to dispense, it should stop lecturing people about spiritual disease. If the church has no healing grace to dispense, it should stop lecturing people about their spiritual disease. A few years ago, while seeing a young lady in a clinical setting, she told me about her serious depression and and her lack of purpose in life, and she revealed to me that she she was sexually active with both men and women, but that her sexual life brought her little pleasure. And I asked her if she felt used and objectified by her sexual life, and she said she did. And I suggested that she might consider a time of celibacy. And when I said that, she wept like a baby. She said, would that be okay? That like wouldn't be weird or something? My background didn't allow me to grasp the fact that there are people in this world for whom sexual restraint seems odd or perhaps unthinkable. So what was I going to say to this secular young lady? They had no idea I was a pastor and and no sense of sexual morality, at least as I defined it. I said, well, it's your choice, you know. If your sexual life isn't bringing you any joy, maybe a time of restraint could help you decide what's best for you. 
And I just couldn't believe it. She smiled really big, like with delight. And she said, I'll do it. I'm going to tell all my friends that I'm going to try out celibacy for a few months and they should respect my decision. I just was amazed by that. And I think about her from time to time, how her liberated way of life had become a prison that was making her suffer. People become promiscuous or take drugs or cut themselves or obsessively shop. That's a Christian kind of uh, addiction. Overeat, another Christian addiction. Or refuse to eat, that's a difficult one. Because they want something or some, someone or something to touch their soul. Their soul is crying out for attention. They don't know what to do for themselves. And that's true of believer and unbeliever alike. What great comfort this chapter ought to bring all of us that the great physician came into the world not to condemn us and make us feel even worse about ourselves than we do, but to heal us and to restore us. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Praise God. Do you know Jesus is here right now? When Jen read the scripture earlier in the service, I said, Lord, we're, we're the Pharisees, we're the scribes, we're also the tax collectors and the sinners. Our soul is sick. Please come among us. Many times we think the Lord won't come among us unless we get everything all straightened out, but this text doesn't indicate that. It indicates that the Lord comes among us when we just ask him to. We can't, we can't get good enough to get the presence of God in here. We've got to get the presence of God in here so we can get good. Whatever your issue is today, I'm going to tell you. It's, I, I know your particular issue, you're, you're very ashamed and all that, but it's the same issue I struggle with. It's the same thing everyone else here struggles with. And it's this, how can I be healed? How can I become aware of my soul? How can I nourish my soul legitimate needs? Jesus hears the cry of your soul and he stands like this priest in Les Miserables to sing to you. Come in, sir, for you're weary and the night is cold out there. Though our lives are very humble, what we have, we have to share. There is wine here to revive you and there is bread to make you strong. There's a bed you can rest till morning, rest from pain, rest from wrong. I want to open up the front here. For anybody that would like to come to stand in for yourself or for someone else. Maybe you have a loved one that's struggling with something I've mentioned today or something I haven't mentioned. And you don't know how to help them. You'd like to ask the Lord to give you wisdom to know what to do next for them or for yourself. You just come and stand. going to have prayer cloths up here if you want to take to a loved one as well. All of that's available today.
you stand, please? I wonder if you'll do something for me as we're beginning to close out service. We'll continue to pray here in the front. And if you want to continue to come, please feel free to. I wonder if you'll just make sure that every pew in this place is touched. If you want to walk around as we pray, I want you to pray that this year these pews will fill with people like I've described here today, people who want to know they have a soul. And pray that God would give us grace to lay down every bit of judgment, every kind of judgment. We, we want people to straighten up. We, many of us have been raised in... Uh, church and we've been raised in a country to where people just knew what they're supposed to do and they ought to just straighten up and do it. We don't live in that kind of world anymore and so we often come across as a world of just, just, just people just griping all the time. And in the end we can't make anybody straighten up anyway. Have you found that out? I wonder what it would do if the Lord just deliver us from all controlling spirit and just say, you know what? I, I don't have any more thing to say to you except come unto me, all you the weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people come and find a church like that and just walk in and find immediate, ex immediate acceptance no matter what their issues are? Just find immediate acceptance and soak up the grace of God. There's all kind of testimonies all over the here of people that struggled with just insane things that went to church for years and kept it maybe secret and then gradually begin to notice something began to happen or maybe it was instantaneous or some encounter with God and they were healed can't God still do that hallelujah the same God that saved us saved our parents saved our grandparents saved our great grandparents however deep we are in the Christian faith doesn't that God still exists that says coming to me all the weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest let's do that just touch the pews will you do that Heavenly Father we thank you for a message, Lord, in Luke's gospel here today that tells us that you didn't come into the world to judge the world. There'll be a time for judgment is later. But right now, you're just wooing people to come to yourself to be healed. Healed, healed, healed in the profound depths of our soul, healed. Oh, Lord, we, we need your healing touch, Lord. Lord, we need your healing touch as believers, as these Pharisees and scribes needed the healing touch to welcome those who were new into the kingdom of God. Help us to do that too, Lord. Lord, I pray, oh God, you'd fill this place with that kind of love of Christ. And Lord, that you, as it pleases you, you will do signs and wonders and miracles of deliverance and healing. Lord, that will confirm the word that we preach. In the mighty name of Jesus, transform us, make us new. Make us like Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah. God bless you. Go in peace.